Good morning, Uncle. Hello. Good morning. Yes. So nice to see you today. Thank you. And uh, from all the Sahaja Yoga, we would like to thank you so much. Thank you. For all your contribution to Sahaja Yoga. And um, it's a very um, our privilege that you agreed to talk to us. Thank you. For some time. So, Uncle, we would like to know a few things from you as to uh, if you could briefly tell, like, how did you meet Shumataji? Mm. Okay. Okay. I was a seeker since very young age. Uh, but my seeking was mostly to reading. I read about many, many things related to spirituality, classic yoga, and so on. So this went since the age I was 14 or so, up to 93. Uh, when I was abroad in, as a visiting professor in Princeton, and then they made a public program, Sarge Yoga is there, and they let a leaflet in my mailbox. Then for the first time I, I came to uh, an event. And that, that's how I got my realization. And late, this was 6 March 1993. So I met Shimata as a physical next year, 94. In Cabell. Oh. I came to Adishai to do. So, um, what was your experience like of Kundalini? Like, when did you feel your energy? Like, was it instant or? It was fantastic. Uh, I had, I felt, I felt I had my realization. When I came to the program, before it started, I felt something cracking here. Uh, and then this compulsion to read stopped. Okay, so I would like to know a secret. Like, what is the secret behind your always smiling and joyous face? <laughs> Well, you should always look like that. If you have a picture, you can look it either from the front side or from the back. I always try to look the world from the right side. From the, like a picture, you can see from this side or from the back. I always look things from the the front. Maybe that's why. That's the answer to your question. <laughs> um, what advice do you give your bees? Like how to be in joy all the time. So for that, what do you think all the yogis should do? Okay. We should always Keep the attention in this connection, inner connection to Shubhan. I think this is. But all, also try to see the world through the correct side. Try to make your life uh, beautiful and effective. You can do it. So Uncle, um, we all know that you are one of the most uh, world-renowned quantum physicists. So, how come you came into quantum physics and when was this discussion with Shumataji regarding quantum physics and when did she advise you and how did this all happen? You know, you came up with this book of yeah. science and Well, science. I decided to do physics when I was also very young, maybe, say maybe, 
Srimata, you mean I wrote the book on science and spirituality. Srimata, he asked me to include two chapters on quantum physics. And in spite of the fact that I knew very well what quantum physics is, I was teaching quantum physics for 20 years or so. I knew exactly what it is. And I knew what Sanji was. But I had no idea of the relation between both. So I didn't know what to do. So I sat down with white paper, pen, put the attention here, and the ideas started to flow. And it's it time even more strongly. And I wrote it or whatever it came. So I find found many things which I in these chapters on quantum physics. Wow. So uncle, because we are laymen, we do not know anything about much about quantum physics. So if you want to explain in like few words or like maybe few lines as to how okay. exactly is quantum physics and how it is related to Sahaja Yoga. Yeah, I, I realized that because quantum physics can be summarized in... So, in classical physics, if you describe, for example, the motion of a part, you can determine precisely what's the trajectory, the, the position that the part occupies at each time. Now, provided we know the forces that act on the system, we can predict the future behavior in the future trajectory. In quantum physics, it's not so. So this applies to microscopic objects, objects which are of size comparable to ours, like planets, tennis balls, airplanes, and so on. Now, when you try to apply these ideas to the systems of atomic scale, they just fail. And what happens is that there are many different ways in which you can summarize the properties of quantum physics. But one thing, one way, is the fact that you can no longer determine what is the trajectory of the path. We can only have probabilities of different positions. And so you're talking about the microscopic level. Yeah. So yeah. there we cannot find yeah. the trajectory. Yeah. And then I realized that this is why you can have the forms of object. Because the most basic constituents of matter are formless, a point part like electrons and quarks. They don't have an extension. So how can you produce the form out of the formless? And this is achieved, accomplished, through the answer, so called uncertainty principle, which according to which you cannot determine with arbitrary precision the position and the velocity of a part. So this creates, for example, in taking a hydrogen atom, it creates the illusion of a spherical object. But what is spherical? It's just a mathematical probability of finding the electron. The, if you measure the, the letter, you find a point, dimensionless point. So, in order to have the illusion of the form that we meet in our everyday life, 
We need this uncertain, which is a consequence of the action of Shiva Mahamaya. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a universe manifested with the multiplicity of forms that we know. Okay. So you're saying it is something like it is uncertain and is autonomous and is determined by God's will. Well, not quite. Well, it is. There are laws, like in classical physics, Newton's laws determine if you know the forces that act, we can determine the trajectory. Here in quantum physics, if you know the forces that act, we can determine the probabilities of this particle of motion. Mm -hmm. So this is a precise mathematical way to determine. So it's but of course these laws were creations of God, either the class or the quantum. So I wouldn't say that this probabilities, the fact that there are probabilities, mean this uh, is the will of God. I mean, any of the laws, even the, the deterministic ones, they are manifestations of God. Okay. So, just deviating from quantum physics a bit, so how, how do you see the interjection of science and spirituality? Like, what is that point where the scientist should question that, okay, this is where we don't have answers in the present situation today? Yeah, science brings us to one step of God. So it, it brings us towards spirituality because studying the, the universe, the nature, we, we find the footprints of God. But it takes us to a, one step of God. Science cannot do the last step. Uh, so, science, for example, one good example is the Big Bang. Because science reached the conclusion that the universe didn't exist from infinite time. It started to exist about 13 billion years ago. And all the matter, energy, space and time started to exist at that moment. So the question is what? was before the Big Bang. And according to an author of science, an author of science, scientists would say, you cannot ask this question. But I think this is at least lack of curiosity. So we can try to figure out what was before the Big Bang. Like for example, time didn't exist. So whatever existed before should be beyond time, means eternal. Space did not exist. So whatever existed before should be formless because the forms manifest in the background of space. So, I think this is a good example of how we can uh, reach a point where science cannot go further. Because the laws of science are expressed in the background of space and time. So if space and time didn't exist, 
you cannot. I mean, you, you can, you cannot use the scientific uh, methods, you know, to explain.